So our next panel here is on moral rights. Again, we're discussing moral rights in the context of digital copyright. And our moderator for today, a little bit of a change from the schedule in front of you, Professor Lee was stuck in a snowstorm and he is not here. And so Professor Ocho from Santa Clara Law, who is already on your programs, will be doing a double duty service here, both speaking and also moderating the panel. And, and, and if I could just briefly introduce him, he's a professor, Santa Clara Law, an extensive background in copyright law, and I just learned that he is also a two-time winner of Jeopardy. And I love that. so with that introduction, let me turn it over to him. Uh, so thanks very much. Um, uh, Professor Ilhung Lee from University of Missouri was supposed to be the moderator for this panel and uh, uh, he was heading to the St. Louis airport when they got, uh, you know, 30 inches of snow or whatever it was yesterday. Had to turn around, took him six hours to get back to, uh, to uh, Columbia, uh, having driven 30 miles. So, <laughs> um, so he sends his regrets, but he did send his PowerPoint slides along with uh, pictures of the snowstorm. Uh, so I'm going to try to briefly give you the introduction to our panel that, that he was hoping to give, uh, and then I'll introduce each of our panelists. So when we're talking about moral rights, the obvious first question is what exactly is moral rights, uh, obviously with regard to copyright law. And um, moral rights stems largely from the French notion that an author has certain rights that are inherent in, uh, by virtue of the act of creation. You have the economic rights in copyright. French use the word droit moral, so this is a literal interpretation, moral right, right? Well, what do you get? Well, independent of the author's economic rights, the author gets the right of disclosure, the right to decide when and where to release the work to the public, gets the right of attribution, the right to be identified as the author of the work, the right not to have anyone else identified as the author, the right not to be identified as the author of a work you did not create. Uh, and the right of integrity, the right to have the work presented in the form in which the author created it. Right? And uh, these rights are perpetual, they last forever in France, uh, and they're inalienable. The author cannot waive them in advance. Now, of course, you know, they can be waived, anyone can just not enforce their rights, but they can't be waived in advance of, of the dispute arising. Right? After there's been a dispute, then often there is a payment and a waiver of moral rights, but it can't be waived in advance. Uh, and it can be exercised by one's heirs after one's death for, a, uh, again, in theory, perpetual period of time. Okay. Now, the Berne Convention also provides for moral rights. This is an international treaty to which the U.S. is, a, is now a member. Uh, but introduced in the 1928 uh, version, there is an attribution right and an integrity right. They didn't do the disclosure right, but they have an attribution and integrity right in the Berne Convention. And all countries that subscribe to the Berne Convention are supposed to provide these rights for authors. Now, my, maybe what we object to is the term moral rights, right? Maybe that doesn't sound like something we'd want to enforce. Maybe we should go with the German term, Urheber <laughs> Persönlichkeitsrecht. It's as good as I can get out, right? Which is the right of the author's personality. Maybe that's a little closer to what we mean. Uh, Professor Lee, being from Korea, also provided us with this. In uh, I have no idea, but uh, uh, he did say that the Korean is derived from the Chinese characters for this, and that's the character for person, right? So again, personal rights, rights that are, the, that are personal to the author. Uh, and so he came up uh, with, uh, you know, he wants to present, you know, three, three hypotheticals that illustrate sort of the scope of moral rights protection that we might be concerned about. You know, um, obviously this is a famous public domain work, but if we were assuming that this work was still under copyright, what happens if somebody wants to do that? All right. Put a, now, I think we can all agree we don't want them to put a mustache on the original painting. Right, that would be problematic, uh, and that's uh, something that that our limited moral rights registration in the U.S. tries to address. Uh, but if you're going to take reproductions of the Mona Lisa, what's the harm if we take some of those reproductions and put a mustache on them? The author might object and say, "Hey, you're making fun of my work." Right? 
Uh, and in the US, we'd say, yeah, well, sorry, dude, that's free speech, that's a parody. Uh, and in France has exception for parody too, but where the parody exception leaves off and the author's moral rights uh, allow them to prevent this kind of uh, violation of the integrity right, uh, it would not be entirely clear. Now in the US, claims of moral right haven't fared very well. We see here, you know, moral rights, that's the law of foreign countries, not something we have. American copyright law does not recognize moral rights. No federal claim for violation of plaintiff's alleged moral rights. Uh, doesn't go very far if you claim moral rights. Uh, what we do see is people trying to claim moral rights under existing causes of action. They'll try unfair competition, some type of civil rights claim, defamation, right of privacy. Uh, for some time, some success with false designation of origin. I'll talk about that a little bit uh, when I get to my part of the talk. Um, but those have occasionally succeeded, not very often succeeded. And of course, in the US as a practical right, you can waive it by contract. Right? If you're creating a work for hire or if you're creating a work for somebody else, they're saying, you know, give me a contract that says you're not going to sue me about anything. And as a practical matter, they've got the bargaining power, so we do have the, that type of waiver. Uh, another famous moral rights controversy that came up in the US, director John Huston said these nasty things. What was he saying them about? Colorized versions of motion pictures that were made in black and white. And those of you who were around in the mid-1980s remember this controversy. Ted Turner was trying to colorize black and white movies on the theory that the color versions would be more popular. And uh, a lot of the directors and cinematographers of these black and white movies were really furious. These were made to be seen in black and white. You're really desecrating them if you do it in color. Um, in France, John Huston succeeded in getting that ban. That was a violation of moral rights in France. The US takes a typically more free market view. What we ended up with a law was with a law that said, OK, you can do it, but you have to label it. You have to say, this has been colorized, this has been altered to fit your screen, et cetera. Right. Uh, more quotes from John Huston on the colorization debate. Right. Now, we do have the Visual Artists' Rights Act. It's a law that looks like a moral rights act. It's the right to claim authorship. That looks like a paternity, uh, the attribution right. The right to prevent intentional distortion, mutilation, or other modification. That looks like an integrity right. But it's a very limited right. It only applies to works of visual art, and which really means the single original or limited editions of 200 copies or fewer. It's not really a moral rights statute. It's really an art preservation statute that's couched in the language of moral rights. And of course, it's subject to fair use. That limitation has not really been tested in court yet. And the rights can be waived in advance, which isn't something that you would see in a European jurisdiction. Uh, a final example of a hypothetical close to academics everywhere, the mangled law review article. Right? The author of a law journal comment sued the law school for distorting and mutilating the work, and the district court said, nope, sorry, you don't get that, and that was affirmed on appeal. Okay. So with that brief introduction to the world of moral rights, we're happy to have our panel. Uh, we're going to go in the order that's listed here. So first, we'll introduce uh, Ms. Allison Akbay, who is the uh, registrar for the Cantor Center for the Arts here at Stanford. Uh, and I'll let her tell you what being a registrar involves. Uh, and then myself. And then uh, we'll have Professor Mo Molly Von Howling from uh, the University of California at Berkeley, Boat Hall School of Law. Uh, and um, uh, so we'll each talk for about 15 minutes and then open it up for questions. Hey, I'm going to make a plug. If you're here this weekend, please come to Counter Arts Center. It's a free museum here on campus. We have um, 36,000 items in our collection, about 12,000 which may be under copyright. We're investigating. 12,000 is, excuse me, 12,000 is a lot of items when you're investigating item by item to see what's under copyright. So um, I'm a registrar. A registrar control looks at what goes in and out of the museum in terms of art, kind of like a registrar for a university, looks at which students come in and out. 
These days that means registrars do things like contracts with uh, vendors, artists, loans, and is usually a database manager as well. I'm actually the registrar for digital asset and rights management. We're digitizing our collection. We, um, like most museums in the US, we had never taken pictures of most items in our collection, or the pictures were in all sorts of formats, so we started over again, and we're doing great. Are we allowed to put these pictures online of the copyrighted items is one of the things that museums are dealing with. But let me talk for a moment about artists' rights, first of all. So the Visual Art, um, Artists' Rights Act of 1990, to me, is talking about this. Many of you might be familiar. There was a French, a, excuse me, a Spanish fresco that looked like uh, this farthest on your farthest image. And then over time, it started to deteriorate and looked like in the middle, what it looks like in the middle. And then a person in the community decided to go in, an untrained person, and restore the fresco and resulting in the image on the right. It made international news. Now, what this Rights Act is about is protecting, to me, as a layperson, I have no legal degree, I should have said that in the beginning, is about protecting the reputation of the artist. Now, this work happens to be in the public domain. The artist died more than 70 years ago. But if he was alive, I doubt he would want his name associated with the image all the way to your right. Um, the image in the middle, he probably would be unhappy about as well, but this act actually says that normal degradation of the art over time due to light and air and such is not covered, and that you can only, um, this only comes up if there's actual negligence involved with the deterioration of the artwork. In this case, I think it's clear that this was not a, a trained conservator who worked on this work of art. But let's say this was a modern work of art made after June 1991 when this act came, in, came into play and someone was trying to sell the image all the way in the end as by this artist, this artist could say, I do not want, unless he waived the right ahead of time, he could say, I do not want my name associated with this art anymore. And that's what this, art, this act allows you to deal with. I know of very few times this has really come up um, I know of a case where a museum in the U.S. had a piece of outdoor art that kept getting graffiti on it, and they just kept um, the grounds crew of a public park just kept like painting it over with gray paint, and it started to look really bad, and also the piece was rusting, and the artist really became concerned that it was going to fall on someone and kill them, and also didn't think it looked good any anymore, and he asked that they take it down or remove his name from any association with it. So that's an example, but it didn't go to court. Um, another place this might come up with is I know a museum that had a sculpture fall off a balcony. Someone ran into it and it smashed on the floor. They repaired it, but it didn't look great. And so the artist um, agreed to take the work back, agreeing never that it would never be sold because he did not want his name associated with this restored work of art. And in that case, the museum was fine with that. He actually included a replacement work of art. But this really comes up with something that is restored in a bad way. The other thing that this act agrees with is that you, your name be associated with a work of art and that your name not be associated with a work of art you didn't make. Um, and this comes up in terms of digital copyright to me in terms of works like this. This is a work we have on campus um, in back of the museum. It's a loan by Richard Serra called Sequence. I am currently working with the artist. He's very particular about how w images of his work are taken and published, and I'm working with him. He said he loves his picture, but he has not yet signed the agreement with me to let me publish it, to put it in our ads and let people know it's here. Um, I do have permission to show it today. But if you go to Flickr, it's all over the place. So, and most people have no idea what it's of, who made it, where it was taken. And that really brings to question, doesn't the artist have a right to have his name associated with the work or not. The question also comes up, you know, if he doesn't like any of these pictures, should people be allowed to put his name? This is kind of a maze that you walk through is kind of the feeling you get inside. And he really only wants pictures more like this where you see the whole thing. And people love to take pictures so it looks like a canyon. Um, it's really a question. Another question that comes up here is this is our Flickr group on, uh, for the Cantor Arts Center. And many museums are really struggling if I make this group and say, here, if you would like, you can tag your photo with our name and put it in this group on Flickr, am I encouraging people to break copyright? These are the sort of things that museums are struggling with. And do we have, under a moral right, to protect the artist, to not encourage people to 
publish images and works of art. And when people contact, I happen to work, uh, work for rights and reproductions in the museum, so people ask me about publishing this work of art. And I, it's very clear for me, I, I simply, we don't, we're not the copyright holders, and they're your images, so you please contact the artist. Um, another work we have here on campus, really encourage you guys to come and see it, is Andy Goldsworthy's Stone River. It's in front of the museum. It's made out of pieces of buildings that fell down the 1906 or the 1989 earthquake. And uh, Andy Goldsworthy, he sells photographs of his work. So he'll make a sculpture, and sometimes it'll be temporary. Let's say he makes a bridge out of ice, and before it melts, he takes pictures of it. So in addition to actually making sculptures, he sells his own images of the sculptures. Therefore, he's really not fond of other people selling images of his sculptures, because that's how he makes his money. Um, we have permission from him to use pictures of this for, th for our day-to-day -day nonprofit use, including teaching. It is also all over Google. Um, again, usually not at all associated with his name. So it's a real question whether the uh, Visual Artists' Rights Act 1990 does it, in, does it extend to the right for artists to have their names associated works on the internet? And it's still under debate. Now, museums are very conservative. We move at a glacier, glacier rate, and we never put up pictures of anything without having the name of the artist and the work of, and when it was made and everything, the title, all together. Unfortunately, museums are very conservative, which means we do not pick up, put up any pictures of any work of art that's under copyright unless we have the copyright holder's permission. I have 12,000 works of art that might be under copyright. For the past three years since I was hired, I've had a student who all they come in is 10 hours a week investigating just basic life dates of artists to see just the basic, when did this person die? which is becoming easier to do. Getty um, in LA keeps a nice database of this work. There's a few works. Um, there's a uh, website called the uh, Art, uh, Writers, Artists, and Our Copyright Holders website called Watch out of the University of Texas, which tries to be a clearinghouse for copyright holders. But everyone is putting up pictures of art, our art except us. And this is the real issue because if someone wants to find out who made this work of art, and I can't put a picture of it up on our website, they're gonna have a really hard time finding it. They might even know it's at our museum, but they can't find its correct name because no one on the internet has put its correct name, and we don't have a picture of it with its correct name on the internet. So um, I was asked to talk about moral rights of artists. It was not, it's not really an issue in museums because we don't, we would never, we really don't think of putting up a work of art without association with the artist's name. When someone asks to print, uh, we have the Thinker, Rodin's Thinker, which is in the public domain at our, um, we have it in our lobby. People ask me to, for images of it. It's public domain, so I can't tell them whether to print or not, but if they want our image of it, one of the things we do is I ask the curator, do you think this is a good use? And I explain this to people, Rodin's Thinker in a book, Probably a yes. Rodin's thinker on a tote bag, maybe. Rodin's thinker on underwear, probably not. Because we try to think, even after the artist is dead, this idea of would the artist have wanted it used this way? And it's a real question, you know, it sh should everything, even for public domain works, we will not crop them unless we think it keeps the artist's intent. But that is a moral question, which in the US is not covered by law, while in other countries it is. So, um, these are some of the issues that are coming up from museums with digital rights. Uh, we also, these are some of the new problems. Some of the old problems in terms of this, uh, is it gonna, there we go, are just orphaned works. If you're in the Bay Area, you've probably seen work by this artist. We have um, the image on the right, Shadows of the Future, is near Tresseter Union here on campus by Benamino Bufano. The image on the left is uh, Bear and Cubs, which is at the Oakland Museum and right in front of their entrance, and everyone associates it with the museum, and you'll never ever see it on their website because they can't find who the copyright holder is. No one is sure what happened to the copyright holders. At one point, there was a foundation for this artist that closed, and as far as I know, and it could be someone has found someone since then, but no one knows who the state holder is. Hillsdale Mall is full of sculptures by this artist, which is right down the road, all over the US, very famous artist from the 
um, 1930s but died less than 70 years ago, so they're under copyright, and we have no idea. Now the question for museums is, you know, do we put pictures of this work online? Yes or no? We're taking a risk. How much is our risk? I went to the American Museum of Asso American Association of Museums conference a couple years ago when there was an attorney from the Smithsonian pleading with everyone to put this sort of stuff online, saying unless you're not selling a tote bag, you're putting a picture of it online, you're not making any money, you're probably okay even if someone asks you to take it down, you take it down. But museums are extremely, extremely cautious about this. So um, another thing that's come up with museums lately is people are trying to share their data online. This is a picture from the Google Art Project. So Google is asking museums from all over the world, I think they have about 280 museums involved right now, to submit beautiful pictures of their work and data about it and put it online so you can search all across the collections. There are currently 72 works by Rodin from museums all over the world on this and zero works by Picasso. That would be because Rodin's in the public domain and Picasso's not. Ye this is a picture from the Yale Center for British Art. They have put up over 5,000 items, none of them being under copyright. So I talked to them about it and they said, well, we could go to the trouble of contacting the copyright holders, but we have 5,000 things in the public domain, so we decided to put them up, which is great. Um, SF MoMA has 29 items. And they contacted every copyright holder about it, and some people said no. Um, we're considering taking part in this, and it's several hours of work to locate each copyright holder, then to draft a letter with a, we drafted a letter to send to copyright holders with lawyers here at Stanford, um, because we don't, we have some agreements, existing agreements with artists, but we don't think it covers what Google does. Um, Picasso and many other recent artists are um, represented by a copyright clearing, one of several copyright clearing houses in New York. They have all said that they, and there was a New York Times article about this, you can look it up, that they do not, they will not grant any rights of any other artists to be involved with the Google Art Project. They would like an agreement with Google, not with each individual museum, and Google is asking it, each individual museum to get the rights. So currently out of, let's see, 127 items we're considering putting on this, um, 35 were represented by copyright houses in New York, so we have taken them off the list, including many beautiful things like the sculpture many of you passed out front, the Caldera black swooping um, falcon out front, which is represented by a copyright house in New York, and so we, we won't work on that. Um, we have, museums are so um, hesitant about putting stuff online that um, things like this are not going online. Um, this one actually I said yes, definitely put it online. This is, we have per first of all permission from the estates of both artists who made the work in the background and it's also of the dancers. I think this is clear, this is our st yearly student party where about 3,000 students come to the museum to see other students perform and look at the art. But it's a real issue for museums. It's such an issue um, that the American Association, the Association of Art Museum Directors of the United States um, released a policy statement in 2011 stating that they would like all the, that they, all the museum directors agreed and that they'd like all museums in the US to follow that to put thumbnails of copyrighted works online, that they think it follows fair use. And they, they gave a size for the thumbnail, which is a big thing. How big is the thumbnail? Even if you say a thumbnail is like, okay, is it 500 pixels or is it tiny? Does it have to lead to something else? So they gave exact, they took the great step of taking an exact size of a thumbnail because the courts haven't as far as I know. And they said it doesn't have to lead to anything, so it's not a link. And art museums currently in the US are doing this, but when you have to decide item by item, it's hard, um, especially when the rest of the world is assume, seems to be assuming that the internet does not have copyright. So this went a bit beyond um, artists' moral rights, but it brings up some of the issues that museums are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm old fashioned so I do actually have paper copies of that policy statement. If anyone's interested, I'd encourage more people to hear about that. Thank you.
Uh, when we talk about moral rights, the position of the United States is complicated somewhat by the fact that we are a member of several international treaties that purport to require us to respect moral rights. And so I thought I'd uh, set the stage for Molly's talk by talking a little bit about where we are in terms of treaty compliance. Right, so we can start with the Berne Convention. And we've talked about the Berne Convention briefly already. Uh, this provision dates back to 1928, but it's in the most recent revision of the Berne Convention from 1971. And this is the version that the United States agreed to when we joined the Berne Convention on March 1st, 1989. Uh, and so Article 6 bis looks a lot like a moral rights statute. It says, independently of the author's economic rights and even after you've transferred the economic rights, so you can sell the copyright, you can sell, uh, you can publish, sell it to a publisher, they own the copyright now, right? But the author still has the right to claim authorship of the work and to object to any distortion, mutilation, or other modification of the work which would be prejudicial to his or her honor or reputation. That language comes straight out of the Berne Convention. Okay. And it also says that the rights granted by the author shall be maintained at least until the expiration of the economic rights. So we've pledged to recognize these rights for authors for a period of life plus 70 years. Okay. Now, when the 76 Act was coming around, we were thinking about joining the Berne Convention eventually, and we looked into this question of moral rights. This was the copyright revision study. And they said, well, you know, we don't really recognize moral rights. If you use the label moral right, and if you try to sue on something that's designated a right of attribution or right of integrity, you're not going to get anywhere, right? But without using those labels, we do reach a lot of the same results through different types of things like unfair competition, like defamation. Uh, a lot of these were contract cases where there was a contract for publishing and then they didn't put the name on there and they sued and they said yes, that was an implicit term of the contract. Um, so, you know, you've got this uh, assertion that in fact we're close to complying even though we don't call it moral rights. That's what happened. And that was given a big boost just before the 76 Act was passed because you had this Monty Python case. So in the, in the Monty Python case, you had heavily edited episodes of Monty Python's Flying Circus that were broadcast on ABC. And ABC tried to cut out anything that could possibly be offensive to anybody. And of course, if you've seen Monty Python, the entire basis of the humor <laughs> is that it's offensive to anybody. So if you cut all the offensive parts out, you were left, off, left with you know, meaningless skits that didn't go anywhere. And not surprisingly, the members of Monty Python were upset about this and they sued. Now they did win their case, but it was kind of a fluke. Right? They won because they had retained the copyright in their scripts. And they said, you know, well you're making unauthorized derivative works here. So they won under copyright because it was an unauthorized derivative work, but we know that most of the time people who write scripts are writing them work made for hire and they don't have the rights. And so they can't sue to, to uh, under copyright for their integrity right because they've sold the economic rights to a movie studio. Uh, they also successfully invoked Section 43A of the Lanham Act, false designation of origin. Um, the relief here isn't so much you can't do it, but it's a disclaimer, right? You have to broadcast a disclaimer that Monty Python had nothing to do with this and doesn't want their name associated with it. Um, but they were able to, to get an injunction to keep this broadcast from happening again. So, uh, when the time came for us to join the Berne Convention, the U.S. points to this case and says, see, we recognize moral rights, we're just fine. Right? So here's the, uh, House re the Senate report uh, for the Berne Convention Implementation Act, and they say the same thing. Right? If you call it moral rights, you seek relief under moral rights doctrine, you don't get anywhere. But we have essentially the same protection under various provisions of the Copyright Act, under the Lanham Act, under various state statutes. We are in compliance. Now that was a joke then, and it's a joke now. Everyone knew we weren't in compliance, right? But this was our fig leaf. Gilliam provided the fig leaf to say, yes, we're actually in compliance with moral rights. We can join the Berne Convention. How do we know we weren't in compliance? Well, take a look at what was actually passed. Not the Senate report, but the actual language. The Berne Convention is not self-executing. The obligations under the Berne Convention only can be performed uh, in accordance with the domestic law. So you can't sue to enforce the treaty itself, only the domestic law. We declare that we are in compliance. Right? The amendments made by this act and the law that exists satisfy the obligations uh, in adhering to the Berne Convention. No further rights or interests shall be recognized or created. 
right? We're, we're, we're in compliance, we're not going to do anything else, and you don't get any other rights, right? Again, can't sue under the Berne Convention itself, uh, does not expand or reduce the rights to claim authorship to object to distortion, mutilation, or modification, and in section 104 sub c, again, you can't sue under the Berne Convention itself. And any rights uh, in a work that derive from this title, other federal state statutes or common law, shall not be expanded or reduced by virtue of the Berne Convention. You know, Methinks Congress doth protest too much, right? They're saying, yes, we're joining the Berne Convention. Isn't this a great thing? You have no rights except what we've already given you, right? You cannot sue to, enjoin, uh, to enforce the Berne Convention itself. Not surprisingly, because we knew that we really weren't in compliance with the Berne Convention, notwithstanding these occasional victories on other types of theories that might simulate moral rights in some circumstances. Okay. Now we do have the Visual Artists' Rights Act, which Allison talked about, um, and it looks like a moral rights statute. Right? It says you have the right to claim authorship of the work, to prevent the use of his or her name as the author of any work you did not create, prevent the use of your name in the event of distortion, mutilation, or modification, and you get to prevent the intentional distortion, mutilation, or modification yourself. Again, not unintentional mutilation, as Allison pointed out, you know, deterioration over time doesn't count. That's exempted from VARA, but intentional distortion, mutilation, or modification. You can enjoin that, and you can prevent the intentional or grossly negligent destruction of a work of recognized stature which leaves courts wondering, well, what is a work of recognized stature and how do we decide whether it's recognized stature? There's definitely some issues there. But the key is the limitations on VARA. It only applies to a work of visual art. And work is defined differently in this statute than from the rest of the Copyright Act. In the rest of the Copyright Act, a work is an intangible. You know, it's an image, it's the, you know, the right to reproduce the sculpture, the right to publicly display the sculpture or the painting. Um, reproductions of a work are copies of a work, but the work is what's protected. Here what's protected is a tangible object. A painting, drawing, printer, sculpture, or still photographic image that exists in a single copy or in a limited edition of 200 copies or fewer. If you've got reproductions of the work, they're not protected at all. You can go ahead and deface, mutilate, modify them as much as you want, as far as VARA is concerned. Uh, might violate the derivative work right if anyone's enforcing or looking at it. But VARA doesn't provide any protection there. It's really an art preservation statute that's couched in the language of moral rights. Plus, there's a whole long list of exclusions. Right? Work of visual art does not apply to motion pictures. They were made darn sure that that exemption was in there. Doesn't apply to books, doesn't apply to magazines, newspapers, periodicals, doesn't apply to works framed for hire, and that's only about half. Right? There's all sorts of exceptions and limitations, doesn't apply to uh, deterioration of the work of art, doesn't apply to conservation unless there was gross negligence in the conservation. Right? Uh, doesn't apply to lighting or placement, so you can move things around. Site-specific art has been held not to be applicable here. Uh, and the rights are subject to 107 fair use. Again, we do not yet have a case testing those limits. We don't know what fair use is when it comes to attribution rights or integrity rights, but it is subject to fair use. It's subject to section 113, which says if it's incorporated in a building, then basically you can get a waiver in advance. Um, and the duration is only for the life of the author. Whereas the, the treaty says it's got to be for as long as the economic rights are there. Okay. Notwithstanding all this, we re-upped. We said, okay, we've got this Visual Artists' Rights Act. It's super limited. It definitely doesn't, you know, we know it doesn't comply, even though we're not saying so. Right? But we re-upped in the TRIPS agreement. We said, we'll agree, again, to enforce Article 1 through 21 through the Berne Convention. However, this time, it's enforceable. The Berne Convention is not enforceable of its own force. You know, you can get a declaratory judgment from the International Court of Justice, but it's literally never happened, right? Um, but so the TRIPS agreement's enforceable. The TRIPS agreement's enforceable. You can go to the WTO and get them to rule that you're not complying with the treaty, and then other countries can issue trade sanctions against you. So what did we say? Fine, you have no rights under Article 6 bits, right? which means Article 6 bis can't be enforced in the WTO even though we agreed to comply with it. Why did we have that, you know, we insisted on that exception. Why did we insist on that exception? Because we knew we weren't in compliance with the treaty. Okay. 
and the fig leaf was further stripped away with the Daystar case. So uh, many of you probably remember the Daystar case, but there was a documentary film on World War II that was produced by Time Life for 20th Century Fox. Fox never renewed the copyright in the movie. They renewed the copyright in the underlying book. That was a separate issue. They never renewed the copyright in the documentary. So the documentary, at least technically, entered the public domain. Right? And that film was copied, edited, and redistributed on video under a different title with the attribution produced by Daystar. Right? So none of the people who filmed the work, none of the people who edited and created the original documentary um, got credit. Now Fox was the one who was suing, which was interesting because they didn't do any of those things. Fox was the copyright owner. Fox was the person who had commissioned the documentary, but they weren't the people who did the actual work, but they were saying, ah, you took our name off of it, therefore you violated you know, our attribution right under Section 43A of the Lanham Act. Right? And the Supreme Court says no, that's not a violation of Section 43A. I think the Supreme Court right, reached the right result under the facts, but its reasoning was incredibly broad, much broader than it needed to be in order to decide the case. They said origin of goods in the Lanham Act doesn't refer to origin of intellectual property. It refers to the producer of the tangible product. It does not refer to the, per not refer to the person who created the intellectual property in the work. And that once a work is in the public domain, you have the right to copy and, importantly, the right to copy without attribution. Right? Now, they didn't have to go that far, but they did. Right? So they said if the work's in the public domain, you've got a right to copy and a right to copy without attribution. Now, if you just read Daystar, you could limit its holding to public domain works, but that's not what happened. Right? Every single lower court that has addressed a attribution claim after Daystar has held that uh, you don't have an attribution claim for intellectual property under Section 43A of the Lanham Act because of the Supreme Court's broad reasoning. So the fig leaf that we had from Monty Python, which said, well, Section 43A at least gives you an attribution right, that's gone because under the Supreme Court's interpretation of 43A, the attribution right really doesn't exist. And we do have a few statutory provisions that give us something that looks like an attribution right in some circumstances. So this is the digital performance rights. This is uh, webcasting, it's satellite broadcasting, digital audio transmission of a sound recording. And you get a statutory license under certain circumstances. Under certain circumstances, you don't have to get permission from the copyright owner, you just have to pay royalties, you get a statutory license. Well, some of the conditions of this statutory license, if feasible, the transmission must be accompanied by information encoded in the sound recording that identifies the title of the sound recording, the title of the phono record, the featured recording artist, and any information about its musical work and writer. Right? So there's, there's a bit of an attribution right there. Um, the next section, which says what you must do, the first is what you have to do if technically feasible. Second section, which was added in uh, later, what you must do, you must transmit the title of the sound recording, the title of the phono record, and the featured recording artist. Prominently missing, you don't have to transmit the information about the composer or the lyricist. Right? So no attribution right for the author of the musical work, only an attribution right for the performer. Mm -hmm. The Audio Home Recording Act, this goes back to digital audio tape, Right? It says um, you can't encode a digital musical recording with inaccurate information. Right? So you don't have to put any information, but you can't put inaccurate information. And it does say if you transmit a sound recording in digital, you're not required to transmit anything under this chapter. Right? So no attribution requirement, just no false attribution, but no attribution requirement. Right? If you do transmit it something, it's got to be accurate. But that's the source of a sound recording. You know, not really clear that it, that it covers authors, co may cover copyright owners, not really clear it covers authors or performers. Uh, in the DMCA, uh, Section 1202, copyright management information. Well, you can't distribute false copyright management information. You can't intentionally remove or alter any copyright management information if you're trying to enable, induce, facilitate, or conceal infringement, the knowledge requirement and the purpose requirement have proven very difficult to overcome in, in litigation. But this says, you know, um, you can't do false copyright management information, you can't remove or alter it. 
What does that include? It includes the title, it includes the name of the author, in addition to the name of the copyright owner, so we have a bit of attribution there. With some exceptions, the names of performers, writers, and directors in some circumstances. Very limited attribution rights, certainly not the full complement of attribution that we should have under the treaty. Notwithstanding this, we re-upped once again. Right? Back in 1996, the WIPO Copyright Treaty, once again we said, we're going to comply. Right? But the only enforcement mechanism remains through the WTO, and we've exempted Article 6 bis, the moral rights provision of Byrne, from the WTO. So we've promised three different times that we're going to comply with Article 6 bis of the Byrne Convention. We're not in compliance. Everyone knows we're not in compliance, but there's no enforcement mechanism, so we kind of seemingly don't care that we're not in compliance. Um, if we wanted to be in compliance, what would we have to do? That's the subject of Molly's presentation. Thank you. So I'm not sure I'll satisfy that lead up of putting us in compliance with our treaty obligations. Um, and I don't have slides, I have just three, I think, relatively simple points to make. Um, one is that, in fact, imposing moral rights like the right of an attribution on the classic European model would make a big hash of the copyright system. That's my first point. My second point is that we could make things better, less of a hash, using uh, some of the promise of digital technology. And three is about something else that we should do instead, recognizing and embracing a different type of moral rights, not on uh, the traditional model, but to do uh, something else, to take advantage of the promise of the digital age. So to understand my anxiety about the mess that moral rights might make of our copyright system, uh, I want you to combine a couple things that you've heard about today. One is what Allison told us about how complex the copyright system already is with regard not to an extra layer of moral rights, but just to the existing layer of copyrights that we already have for museums and others that collect lots of existing works and want to digitize images of those works. Combine that image with what we heard from Mike Carroll over lunch about how new copyrighted works are generated in the digital age, that is to say, constantly and massively, and not by famous people who you might be able to find, but instead by random people like us who are likely immediately to be generating orphan works for whom the copyright holder is difficult to identify and track down. Given that existing copyright landscape, which I have described as an atomistic one, because it's all these individual people generating and owning their copyrights, if we were to add to that an additional layer of rights held separate from copyright, identified not with the copyright owner but with the author, that would just amplify the complexity of a system that's already complex enough to generate the kind of anxiety uh, among entrepreneurs that we heard something about this morning. Um, so that's what I worry about when I worry about moral rights. And so one thing to think about is how if we were to embrace a vision of adding moral rights to comply with our treaty obligations, or just to reflect the fact, as we also heard from Mike Carroll based on um, experience with Creative Commons, those atomistic individual creators, all of us, some of us do actually care about the substance of moral rights. Maybe more than we care about economic rights, we care about things like attribution, getting proper credit for our work when it's distributed over the internet. So how to embrace that concern without making a mess of the copyright system? Well, I think one way is to figure out how to keep better track of copyrights in general and moral rights in addition so that we know if we want to be compliant with the desires of an author and consistent with copyright as well, who would we go to to ask whether we are making the proper attribution to find out uh, who, in fact, the author of this work is? So one thing we should think about in terms of moral rights is how to keep track of them. So that's my second point. 
how we might avoid letting moral rights make a mess of our copyright system. And I'm optimistic that we could make better use of technology to keep track of things like authorship in order to provide proper attribution to authors as we keep track uh, of copyright and all of the rest of it. Um, I too am a fan and affiliate of Creative Commons, a former staff member and now a board member. And part of the vision of Creative Commons is not just to help authors exercise their autonomy over how their work will be shared and attributed in the digital age, but also to make those preferences machine readable in a way that will make it easier for those who want to take advantage of those permissions to do so in a compliant way, to give the attribution that the authors desire, for example. But frankly, I don't think Creative Commons vision has yet been fully recognized. There are protocols for embedding attribution-related metadata into digital files so that they travel that way around the web, making it easy in theory for people to say, wouldn't it be great? You just scroll over the photo and all of the attribution information that's uh, requested is there for all to see, but we don't yet have full embrace of standards that would make that interoperable and ubiquitous. And we also don't necessarily have the persistence of that metadata. So we just saw the provisions of 1201 that say that this kind of embedded attribution information, it's copyright management information. It can be classified that way. And there are rules about its false provision and about its removal. But those rules say things like you shouldn't knowingly remove copyright management information knowing that that will lead to copyright infringement. They're demanding standards of intent that make lots of commonplace removal of copyright management information not actionable under 1202. And lots of this removal, in fact, takes place. Creative Commons embedded metadata that you might insert when you post something on Flickr won't necessarily still be there when you take that photo and move it to Facebook. So a vision of easy to keep track of, manageable attribution information is one that would make moral rights more palatable to someone like me, concerned about the complexity that they would impose, but we're not there yet. So that's one thing to strive for. I think to make uh, moral rights a more attractive vision in the digital age. But what do I think we should actually focus on doing instead? So the moral rights that we've heard about in the traditional model are about the right to object to certain things, to insist on certain things. I have a vision of a different sort of moral rights that wouldn't give authors the right to make other people stop doing things or do things in a certain way, but instead would give authors the right to release their work when they want it to be released more widely than a copyright holder might want it to be released. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, copyrights are easy to generate and also easy to transfer to other people. And part of the logic of moral rights is recognizing that authors might have desires that are separate from the desires of the copyright holders. Lots of academic authors have those distinct desires. So they may have assigned their rights in a book manuscript, for example, to a publisher who uh, published it and recouped their investment in that. But now the book is out of print. Maybe it's um, not available in any form. And the author would like to make it available, would like to maybe post it on her website or might want to authorize the Google Book Search Project or the Hathi Trust to make it widely available for anyone to read. That author, if they are not the copyright owner, does not have the authority to authorize that dissemination. What if the author wants to do something else? Not release the original version of their work, but release a derivative work because they've had a change of heart and so want to revise the original. Well, that exclusive right to make the derivative work is also held by the copyright owner who may not at this point be the author. 
So I'm more excited about moral rights that wouldn't give those authors the right to object to something that someone else is doing, but instead the right to release and revise their own work in a non-exclusive way, either personally or by authorizing others uh, to do that. This is the type of moral right that I think wouldn't clash with the potential of the digital age, but would take advantage of the potential of the digital age. Um, but again, consistent with this idea that authors and copyright holders might not always be on the same page. So those are my three points. Moral rights complexify a copyright environment that's already super complex in the digital age. Maybe we can <coughs> ease some of that with technology and uh, Creative Commons, I think, is leading the way in trying to think about that. But the law, to the extent that it backs up these efforts, uh, is perhaps too weak. And then finally, I want to think about a new model of moral rights that are about releasing works consistent with the desires of the author as opposed to imposing limitations and objections on their utilization. Uh, so I didn't prepare any particular questions in advance, not knowing until 10 o'clock last night that I'd be moderating this panel. Uh, but let me ask first my fellow panelists if you want to comment on anything that uh, anyone else has said while we're here. And if you're interested in asking questions, please come down to the mic and we'll get started in a moment. But did you want to respond to what the lawyers have said? Uh, will this make your life easier or harder as a registrar? I, w I think I, I have to say I think I have to digest it more. But <laughs> I, I, it, I think it is... Uh, people who bought the rights to publish works made a financial investment mm -hmm. in it that way. And so I would be concerned about their rights mm -hmm. for then people to take it and do other things. There's also the version issue, um, which is the whole issue of the digital age as well that we didn't any of us touch on. Of So you republish a work. How do people know that it's a different version? Um, but this is a issue, whole issue of the digital age that has just come up because things are so easy to revise in general. So I have a question for Allison. I wonder if you ever, in negotiating to get the rights to, say, digitize works in your collection, do you sometimes go to an artist who says, I would love to give you permission, but I am not the copyright owner, and therefore I can't authorize what you would like to do? Um, at this museum, no. Uh, this came up with one of my prior jobs was for was with the World War II submarine in San Francisco, and the Disney Corporation during World War II designed the logos for many different military groups in the United States, and they the agreement is somehow I did not look into it um, that they retain the copyright. Um, so the Pompanito submarine in pair 42 in San Francisco had an ongoing agreement with Disney about what they could do with their, the symbol of the submarine and not. So that would be a case. But in most cases what I find is artists have reserved their rights. Most artists I speak to are very, they just would not, under no circumstances transfer their rights. Um, but they have signed up with groups to administer the rights. So that's what I hear more often. Yeah, we're fine with, I called a group yesterday, a foundation, the email bound, so I called the foundation to see if they had an email, and they were like, oh yeah, that sounds great, but you know, we've signed up with such and such group, and you really have to contact them. I'm sh we're fine with it, but talk to them. Uh, well, it turns out they signed up with a group who will not have anything to do with Google, so. But uh, it's an interesting, that's, I hear more. Um, so I had a, a comment about something you said, which is the promise of technology to make this a little better. Um, and yet that promise hasn't really been realized, right? You know, you've got the Creative Commons information which can be embedded, but routinely isn't being embedded. Uh, and it's a story that I heard um, a couple of months ago, and I don't know the exact details here, but I was told that uh, Corbis and Getty, the formats that they use in distributing pictures routinely strip out the, the copyright information of the photographers. Mm -hmm. Right, and there's, there's a situation where the photographer really wants to say, look, we have this digital information in there. You could send, you know, make your technology such so that the digital information gets sent out and people know where to contact us. And they don't, right? Presumably because Corbis and Getty want you coming to them uh, to license, you know, in, in Corbis's case, in many cases, to license works that are already in the public domain that you shouldn't need permission or ongoing royalty to use but can't find 
without the use of some type of search engine. Yeah, I think there are various strategic reasons why metadata stripping, and also technical reasons, it makes the files bigger. There might be other reasons that it's, um, that it's troubling, which is why I am led to conclude that maybe we need more legal incentives than we have uh, for keeping that information on there. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll comment on that. So I went to a, set, a user conference for our database last week, and a bunch of people were slide librarians, except these days it's all digital. And so their group in the United States, the Association of Visual Librarians, we're all about putting metadata into the images. Mm -hmm. And the woman was saying, I have 50,000 images, and they're all cataloged. I don't want to have to type this all back in. And so her demonstration was all talking to the database company about having built a bridge program just to try to get everything from their database into the files. Mm -hmm. So even if the data is there and people want it attached to images, it's just amount of the amount of stuff involved is very hard. Yeah, I would like to ask, I'm not quite sure I follow the, the, your proposal. So you're saying, let's give the author the right to distribute again, but is, hasn't he give already that right to the copyright holder? That's why he gives an exclusive right, as opposed to a limited right. And you said about making a new war, uh, changing a change of heart and making a new word or turn it. But he has already given that on their distribution. So you're saying changing the rights of distribution and derivative works into calling them moral rights, taking that exclusivity. Then you, the authors get more money if they, if they give it exclusively. Yeah, thank you. So the reason you don't understand my proposal is because I didn't lay it out in any detail and haven't frankly worked it out in any detail and could use good questions like that about it. Um, so you're right to say if this were just a, from the get-go, as soon as you assign your rights to someone, exclusive rights to distribute, you may also distribute alongside them. Well, those exclusive rights wouldn't be worth much to the publisher. That might not even be good for authors. They wouldn't be able to market their rights to anyone. So I need to clearly work it out in more detail than that. To make it seem a little less shocking, I'll remind you that we do have the termination of transfer provision in the Copyright Act that gives after a certain period of time, really exactly these rights. Now, of course, um, my colleague Peter Manel has written about this and um, called it the termination of transfer time bomb because this is also an extra layer of complexity where lots of authors or their statutory heirs uh, could come and reclaim rights that others have come to rely upon over time. And it's also complicated to comply with on both sides. Um, but something that may be follows along those lines, maybe changes the time frame. Um, another different version of this idea would be to give authors a special claim to make fair uses of their work. So put a thumb on the scale in the fair use analysis if the person making the use is not just any old user, but an author who wants to be able to put their work out there. And if you think about it that way, you might also then take into account the other factors in the fair use analysis, like are they having an impact on the market? And in cases where the work is out of print, an author then would have a strong uh, case on that factor as well, that they're not interfering with the market. Um, so something I think more nuanced than only what I've uh, presented here, I would hope could be consistent both with the existence of a publishing industry and the existence um, of this idea. Now another way to implement this idea is through the licensing that Professor Carroll reminded us is so important and managing rights from the get-go. For many academic authors, it may in fact not be necessary to assign exclusive rights to a publisher in order to get their work out to the public, which is what many academic authors care most about. So just part of my point in, um, in emphasizing the distinction between authorship and copyright ownership is to remind my colleagues that they could get themselves in this dilemma if they assign exclusive rights to their works to others. And you would be surprised at how many academic authors are surprised to find that they don't have the right to reproduce or modify their own work once they've assigned their copyright to someone else. Uh, you were next, and then you'll come down to the mic. So after the uh, 
Daily Show with John Stewart, and after Colbert's report, we are unceremoniously dumped into Tosh.0. And if anyone's seen that, that's probably a great example of poor taste. I cringe when I watch it. But there's a question of who, who's but giving. Still the, watch it <laughs> until I can find uh, until I can find the clicker. <laughs> um, they, they have one section called Web Redemption, which goes over in slow motion the, fo the, the foils, foibles of various people. So the question is, where are the, do those videos come from? Are they assigning their rights? Have they assigned their moral rights? Because it essentially shows them in very unflattering light. Any comments on what people have seen on from Tosh.0? Um, I've only seen the show until I get the clicker. Uh, I, I have no idea whether they are licensing this or whether they're just assuming because it's on the web they can use it and we'll wait until we get sued by somebody. I don't know if anyone in the room knows the answer to that, but if, if you do, please come down to the mic and volunteer. <laughs> but uh, do either of you have any thoughts on that? I don't know the answer to the question. I will note that we're actually talking about those aren't necessarily moral rights of authors that you're talking about, but privacy or right of publicity rights of the, of the subjects of these videos, which just goes to show that what we said about the copyright and moral rights system being complicated, there are a whole bunch of other rights that we need to add on top of that to see the full complexity of what you get into when exploiting things in the digital environment. And in fact, state rights of publicity are one of those alternative theories that people rely upon when they're trying to get attribution or integrity rights through the back door. They'll say, you know, oh, if I'm the subject of this, you violated my state right of publicity. Um, but you did remind me of one other thing when you talked about, you know, maybe fair use should get a thumb on the scale when the author is involved. Not authorship so much, but when the subject of the thing is, is fair use. We've seen a couple of decisions that might otherwise be questionable go the way of fair use where the subject of the material has consented to the use, but the copyright owner uh, was reluctant to do so. The Bill Graham Archives case uh, and, and the Spurlock case. In both instances, uh, you had the person who was the subject of a historical book who wanted this material used, but the copyright owner was reluctant to let it go, and the court eventually held it was fair use. I really like this idea of extending moral rights. I think it's, it's really cool and forward-looking for the next 10 years, as, uh, as Mike mentioned. But I'm wondering if this could also include uh, not just moral rights of authors, but also rights of viewers or readers or consumers to do harmless things and which kind of goes back to you know the Flickr group which is taking photographs of Richard Serra's work from different angles and just sharing it for the fun of it you know that's one thing as opposed to something very official like Cantor Art Museum itself putting up a photograph which you know, has some more gravitas to versus, you know, people just clicking stuff. Uh, or like you see on YouTube nowadays, you know, there'll be a lot of stuff which is marked with no copyright infringement intended, <laughs> you know. Uh, and as if, you know, that will help, you know. And actually, most times, nobody really cares about that. Um, but uh, if, if that could be sort of, you know, institutionalized in the sense, or even in GitHub, for example, where there is absolutely no uh, license of any sort uh, attached to the software that people put up in the repository, but tons and tons of people, the whole purpose is to, to create pulls and forks and, and, and you know, do sort of social coding. Uh, and uh, so there's this vast amount of activity that's happening outside the legal system, and it's very happy to be outside the legal system. Uh, it would be really nice to make a boundary around that to ensure that the legal system is unable to get in. <laughs> you know, could that be, uh, I mean, played out in some kind of a moral scenario of some sort? Well, you know, I mean, I, I suppose the first thing I'd say about the legal system is you can't hide. Um, but in effect, you can, because as you say, there's a whole lot of stuff that's going on under the radar. And essentially, it's going on because it's not economical for a copyright owner or anyone else who might allege rights to bring a, an action in federal court to stop individual infringers. And 
you know, the whole, that's the whole reason that we've seen, you know, I mean, you saw the RIAA try this, right? You saw them try to bring actions against individual uh, people making works available on peer to peer file sharing networks. And, you know, they brought thousands of suits and got a couple of, of statutory judgments against people who went all the way and litigated it. Uh, and it, it, you know, it barely put a dent in the amount of people that were doing peer to peer file sharing. Um, and that's why copyright owners have started focusing on intermediaries and started going after internet service providers and then the payment processors and have focused their enforcement efforts on places where there are, are, are bottlenecks where they might be able to try to get someone else to do this enforcement for them. And, you know, I mean, the answer that I'd say to these people is, you know, you know, recognize that reality is going in this direction and work with it instead of against it. And you'll have a much more loyal fan base and, and you know, people who are, are willing to pay, you know, I mean, it's just, the copyright system has become so divorced from what ordinary people think common sense is. And, and that's a balance that I think needs to be restored. Um, at the same time, what we see with an awful lot of this activity, Creative Commons, people really like the attribution license. Right? People really like, you know, I don't mind sharing this, but I'd really like people to know that it was mine. And so at the same time that, that people are willing to say, okay, I'm going to let go of these economic rights, uh, they are saying that, that some aspect of the moral right is important to them. So I, I think what you say has lots to recommend it and would be enthusiastic about thinking about a harm principle in copyright. Um, I'll answer in part with a citation to a great article called Tolerated Use by Tim Wu that's about this phenomenon and also observes that authors may be more likely to tolerate than publishers or other copyright owners, which leads him to think about along the, these lines. In fact, his thinking has inspired my own about maybe under those circumstances allowing authors to authorize that kind of use or using doctrines like latches, for example, to say if you let this kind of activity flourish for a while, you can't then complain about it later. So I think there are lots of things to recommend uh, your sense. I'm not, they resonate in only a limited way with moral rights, although they might be moral. When we talk about moral rights, we think about a, another set of things. But there is this intersection to the extent that authors might be more enthusiastic about inviting that playfulness than other copyright owners might be, than thinking about letting those authors speak up to permit that activity is sort of consistent with my idea. Uh, but, but there's one way in which I think the opposite is sometimes true. I mean, I agree with you in a general sense. Um, but at the same time, violations of the integrity right, I think you see at least a group of authors who are more interested in forcing that than the actual copyright owner. Right, the copyright owner is willing to tolerate violations of integrity right that don't cost them money. Right. Well, I mean, we certainly see that in the examples where the movie's being the, colorized with the permission of the copyright owner and it's the author who says that's right, offensive. Right. You know, so, um, so sometimes the author is more willing to let certain things go, but sometimes the copyright owner is willing to let them go and the author wants to protect their integrity right. And along the lines of what you said, boy, would this make life even more complicated. Right? How do you square an integrity right with fair use? Right? Because fair use lets you do all sorts of things without the permission of the copyright owner, right? including making fun of it in exactly the sort of circumstances where a, an author might be willing to say, that's not fair. Don't do that to my work. Well, I'll just mention that artists do use copyright law to try to use control of their work. You know, um, that it is used that way a lot. You know. I don't, that uh, Richard Serra's piece sequence, he does not want pictures of his work that don't show the entire work. Mm -hmm. And he uses copyright law to control that. For every single person on the internet, no. Yeah, well, but, uh, as you pointed out, on Flickr, it's not working, yeah, right? Exactly. Um, I, you know, and, you know, a large corporation, they may be able to afford, you know, sending automated takedown notices for everything they find on YouTube. I'm sure Richard Serra has got better things to do than looking for every single picture of his work and trying to send a takedown notice because he's unhappy about his work is portrayed, how his work is portrayed. Which is why so many artists have signed up with the groups in New York that have been causing a bit of issues. Right. But then you, you know, I mean, you're asking about users' rights. Right? Well, if I want to take a photograph of a sculpture that's in a public place, shouldn't I be able to do that? Whether or not the author likes how his or her work's been depicted. 
Formally, copyrights got protection for buildings in a public place, architecture, does not have protections for sculpture in a public place in the US law. There are many countries that do have such an exception. The US isn't one of them. Uh, so you know, you take a picture of Sarah's sculpture, he could sue you for copyright infringement if he was willing to bring a, an action in federal court, which I don't think he is. I was wondering about the picture of the de painting of the dean in the lobby where the caldera is in the background. Mm -hmm. Anyway, exactly. <laughs> So um, I'm not a lawyer. I'm a consultant and author in the digital marketing field. Um, I was recently asked to sign a contract by a training company that I was going to be subcontracting for. And in this contract, they put a clause that said that they had full total rights to any materials that I had ever created. <laughs> Um, and that they would be able to use, and I mean, I've written books and stuff, they would be able to use those materials with or without my name, um, and they would be able to modify those materials with or without my permission. I didn't sign the contract because... <laughs> you read the contract, good, I, good before signing, great idea. <laughs> but uh, my question is, you know, but on the other hand, is that actually a reasonable contract? Would, if that had come to a court of law, would, what, what would the actual legal view of that be? Uh, would they, would, is it enforceable? I mean, is it unreasonable or would, they, would that be enforceable? Uh, <laughs> um, well, if I was a judge, I would say that was unconscionable, but I don't know how many judges would be willing to do that. Uh, I, I think that's crazy. Uh -huh. but, but there haven't been any cases kind of like that that you're aware of? Well, except cases generally about the outrageousness of contractual terms and whether at some point they cross the line into unconscionability. But as a matter of copyright law, you are free with a written instrument to transfer your copyrights in existing works to someone else. Um, you would um, be the beneficiary of the termination of transfer uh, provision. Um, so 35 years later, you could revisit that bad choice. <laughs> Good job. Um, I had a question for the panel. I'm really curious in your, your, your view. When I think back, um, I think an elephant in the room, there's a few. And, and I've come down heavy on, on little tiny ants and might go to hell for it, but you know, I'm a hired gun. But I've represented the ants too, so I don't really care. But often, the copyright proprietor, the Goliath, doesn't really care about that little ant. The worry that we have, though, and as I explain, as I'm slowly putting the knife in, it's not you, I'm sorry. Um, but it's waiver and estoppel and latches. And that if you let all the other little ants come at the picnic and nibble around the periphery, then along comes Cox or Universal or, I'm sorry, uh, no names. Um, and then they do it and say, you waived it. You let all these other little people use it and uh, now you've waived your copyright or you were stopped or whatever. Well, don't you think that, because I can tell you from firsthand experience, that has caused lots of carpet bombing from my people's B-52s on Hamlets we didn't really care about. What we were worried about was the next time someone's gonna, a big player, who's gonna really screw you and financially harm you, is gonna come along. And perhaps if the waiver and estoppel and latches rules were modified, so you can tell a copyright proprietor, oh, that's okay, let those kids cut across. They're not, you're not gonna be giving a proscriptive easement to make a real property metaphor to some other big trucking company. You can let those kids from kindergarten cut across the corner, but that doesn't mean you've waived your exclusive rights to that part of the property. So maybe a relaxation, a waiver, latches and estoppel somehow, though I'm not smart enough to concoct it. You guys are the professors. So why don't you just give an express invitation to those little ants? That's what we do with fan sites. Mm -hmm. With fan sites in the entertainment industry to not alienate them. Mm -hmm. We wrote, we share your love of Trek. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we love it. And so we're going to give you a license. We didn't even ask them to sign it. To posture ourselves against the big infringer, who would then make the waiver and estoppel latches argument, we would say, here is a license. <laughs> Below you will find the terms of the license, and it just simply says you won't monetize it, you won't make Spock uh, do dirty things with Uhuru and, um, and, 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 and Mazel Tov, you know, Psychozone. Uh, 
That's a Latin. I, I, but, um, I <laughs> so, you know, so I, I think if, 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 because so many times the, 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 the person singing happy birthday at the sleepaway camp, that type of thing, they get stomped on and it gives IP a bad name or whatever, but you know, I'm a nice guy, but I have stomped on those people because I've had to because the client is justifiably concerned if we let you do it, then the big people who cause us problems do it. So I wonder if you ever thought of that doctrinally and if there's any way to articulate a, a line where it's okay if uh, little guys do it, but it doesn't waive my rights vis-a-vis -vis big players. Well, the client is concerned. I would not agree that the client is justifiably concerned. Because I think that's the law of, I mean, you know, all the decisions I've seen on waiver and estoppel say, you don't waive your right to enforce your copyright just because you haven't enforced it against a somebody else, right? You waive a right against that person, but you don't waive, necessarily waive it against others. Now, I know that there are um, a few exceptions, but the Latchies cases are pretty extreme, yeah. right? You didn't know you were the author of James Bond when it was released, you know, there have been a hundred And Latchies is usually more one-on-one. -on -one. You know. I meant more a general waiver. You know, but I mean, you know, but as Molly says, right, if you, if you send these people a nice letter saying, you know, I need to do this to protect myself, you know, but we can give you express permission, that's not a waiver. And that perfectly takes no, care of No, that's different. You come in and you give overt express permission. So. Yeah, you know, but that's not a waiver. You don't have to stomp on somebody just to preserve your right to you know, battle it out with uh, an alleged big infringer who comes along, along later. Do you think it would help in a copyright notice to put at the bottom some kind of express permission to make monetary use if you're a little kid in Ohio at a lab? Creative Commons license. There you go. <laughs> Bravo. Thank you. Problem solved. All right, cool. <laughs> So uh, there's a lot of creativity, a lot of creation, a lot of authorship, everything that's happening that would be what some people call the long tail now. It's a lot of things that would have never gotten any kind of commercial interest ages ago, but now people are doing it. And because of that, a lot of interesting stuff is sort of bubbling up that, that may never have gotten any attention before. And that's one of the powerful things of the internet and all of this, right? Is there some possibility of the kinds of uh, the kinds of best practices in own communities and things like that that were talked about in the morning uh, making some difference also in this particular area? Best practices for attribution. Yeah, for for laying out, you know, how should you deal with some of the moral ish, moral rights issues and things like that. Well, as I said, the the um, Visual Librarians Association, Library Association, I, mean, I believe it's VLA, has set forth standards for how to embed attribution data into image files, and they're trying to. Librarians are all about standards. So the standards can be across, same across the world. They're way ahead of museums or anyone else on earth about it, and. Um, so they're, they're working on it. Probably, part of it is just the amount of information and the fact that none of us, it's not yet built into cameras. Most cameras, some cameras it is, but we don't, most of us don't set it. Um, just the amount of things being generated. I have to say there are some things we can look at and I am not a legal background. I believe for music and film, there's some exceptions in copyright for sampling, uh, sampling a short, short amount of time. Perhaps we can look into that. That's a whole other panel. It is a whole other panel. But <laughs> let's, talk, let, let's think of that in terms of what if we use that for a model for, for example, for visual images? What if we said, you know, you're allowed to put up an image that's this many pixels in this resolution without having to get anyone's permission? That's what we're kind of trying to do with museums. I and predict we we're going to find out in the next but you panel. Save some, hmm? I predict we're going to find out in the next panel that it's more complicated than we yeah, have but it is sampling too. What I'm getting to is there are some models, and we're all looking for a way. I don't think anyone wants to break the law. Could be wrong. Maybe that one percent we were discussing earlier, but you know, so having guidelines. Part of it is just not having guidelines. That's what, you know, this art museum directors of America are like. Let's put a, you know, we don't want to break the law. What is a thumbnail? Because no one had said what it was. Something as simple as that. Let's try to put some guidelines. We'll follow it. Maybe if we all follow it, it becomes. And, and I guess part of what I was thinking about was this, you know, could communities then have some standards as far as, uh, as, far as copyright um, transfer documents and things like that that would 
allow them to have something that's, for example, a copyright transfer that doesn't transfer it permanently and into perpetuity, but says, look, and if you and if you let this book of mine go out of print for X years or whatever, then um, I can take it back, you know, or something. I mean, are there some ways that this could start to move the right direction so that it's not, from a layman's point of view, so stupid? I, I think a number of publishing contracts have an out of print clause, but certainly it's not standard by any means. But I mean, I think a number. Yeah, I mean, I think a number. It was standard at one point. Until very recently. Yeah. Well, you know, and uh, you know that reflects the bargaining power that authors have against very large publishers, which is not very much in most instances. Um, and I also think that it resulted in a number of orphan works, because you know who's got you know is it out of print? When did it go out of print? Did it revert to the author? Does it not? Um, I do think that is a good transition to the next panel. So, you know, we're happy to stay here the extra eight minutes if you continue to have questions about moral rights. But if not, maybe we can get a little closer back to the regular schedule and, and take our break now. One more question? No, you're not. Okay, great. Um, when do you want to break until? Um, we'll come back at 3.30, so seven or eight minutes. Great. Thanks very much to our panel.